Martin said, I uh, work at eLife as innovation officer, been there for nearly two years now and been in this role for just one year. So it was a new role that was created. Um, and before that, I did a PhD at Cambridge uh, in uh, the general topic of neuroscience. Um, and so come from a life sciences research background. But what I'd like to talk to you today, um, does that work? No, too far. Is that one? Good, okay. Uh, there's lots of things we can say, and I think it's important that I contextualize who eLife are, because we are a publisher, but we're more than a publisher, and there's some things that we're doing and reasons that we're doing them that I think are important to get across, um, which may be slightly boring for you at the beginning, but it does help to set in context. Uh, what I work on is our innovation initiative. I would like to dig into what that is, and that encompasses that we are developing technology ourselves to help scientific publishing, but also we're trying to support a whole community of people who are innovating in research communication and their projects that they do, and we try to support them uh, both with uh, showcasing the work they're doing, but also actually financially uh, helping them to, uh, financial support to help them to develop prototypes and test what they're doing. There is a major project we've embarked on to do with ensuring that reproducible research can be published through the journal infrastructure. And we also have some data science projects at eLife that I think perhaps you might be most interested in. Uh, so I'll try and speed through some bits so that we can spend some good time on the data science. Uh, and I'd really love this to be participatory. Please feel free to put your hand up and ask questions at any point. And I'd like to leave enough room as well for some good discussion at the end. I'm really interested in what your insights might be and what kind of projects you're working on and how they might uh, intersect with what we're trying to do. So thank you for coming today. And let me tell you a little bit more about eLife. So eLife was set up six years ago now uh, with funding from three major research funders in the life sciences. That's HHMI, which is US-based, Wellcome Trust, which are UK-based but fund international research, and Max Planck Society, which is based in Germany. Um, this was a very strong signal that the funders care about changing how the research is being communicated, and they care enough to put a lot of money into a venture to try to change how things were happening. Um, our mission in general, this is our office in Cambridge, and as you walk in, smack in your face every time is the mission, just to remind you why you're in the office. Uh, it's to help scientists to accelerate discovery by operating a platform for research communication, a journal, that encourages and recognises the most responsible behaviours in science, which I'll explain. Um, in general, what we're trying to achieve is to change the health of this publishing ecosystem. And if any of you have ever... Some of you have published already. Um, it kind of differs between domains, but in life sciences, there are some common uh, issues and there are some specific issues to life sciences. In general, we have uh, a set of journals at the top that people aspire to publish in that are not open access. Um, and there is very little incentive for them to develop to serve the community better because they have a stronghold over uh, what people are doing. I just remember this is on YouTube. Um, uh, we also... Uh, are working in a system that has developed from a print publishing um, framework and now we're in a modern system with web technologies and actually it's been very slow to change and adapt and to benefit from that. So researchers aren't seeing necessarily the benefits they could be because the technology hasn't caught up. Um, we, we hear a lot about how the experience of publishing can be very negative. Uh, and so there are lots of gains to be made by making a much better experience for the researchers themselves. That's the point of publishing, is to share your work, um, and especially with a focus on early career researchers. And uh, we kind of have this broad... The way we work is very transparent and collaborative, and the progress we make at eLife, we want to be able to share that with the wider community. Um, we're not here to be the, the dominant publisher. We're here to make sure we use our position and our privilege to make changes that can spread across the whole ecosystem. Um, I mentioned responsible behaviours in our mission, and basically we believe people should be finding all of should be sharing all of their work, so not just the narrative in the publication, but the data, the tools and resources that went behind it, the methods, the code. Uh, we think things should be shared honestly and comprehensively. There's, it's, there's definite value in writing concisely, but we don't need to stick to page numbers because we're not in print, we're on, on, online. Uh, we want people to become more cooperative and collaborative and for research to be able to advance in that manner, um, uh, when at the moment actually it can be quite constricted and competitive. Um, and we have done some things with the journal itself to try to bring more constructive criticism um, and transparency into the peer review process. Uh, that's a definite area that could have been improved um, and takes a long time. Uh, so we have this kind of split mission, in, or uh, this split way in how we deal with this, this whole mission. 
um, in that we run a journal and we want to make that journal the best possible journal we can so that people can trust us to publish with us and they can use the services and that can drive adoption um, in other places. And we also want to use this journal as leverage to enable us to innovate and experiment with all aspects of publishing, help reproducible research to come to light, um, help people to reuse research, help to show off, um, uh, help, to help research to shine, and also to experiment with how we do the reviewing and how that, that happens through a journal. So, uh, so these two things are very much interlinked. Um, I work on the pink bubble side of the spectrum and what I'd like to talk about applies to our journal, but we also want to spread it much further. So eLife is an open access online journal for outstanding research in the life sciences. We are domain specific, uh, but I hope that there's uh, stuff in here that applies to your world too. Um, we're scientist -less led, our, all our editors are working scientists. We don't have uh, desk editors doing any rejects. Um, and we do work very hard to try to make sure the research is communicated to a broader audience. Um, most of our articles, or a lot of our articles, have what's called a digest, which is a plain language summary at the top of them, which is what I read, to be frank, because I can't read the rest of the research unless it's in my a very narrow expert domain. Uh, so there are things that we're trying to do to make sure that that work goes out. And those lang plain language summaries go on to Medium as well, um, or some of them do. Uh, so we see eLife as a place to experiment and innovate, and very importantly, we see this as a place to do it in the open, and we're very transparent about what we're trying to do. Uh, so please do feel free to ask questions um, as I go through. One of the things we do uh, in terms of transparency is we publish the decision letter that reviewers send to the authors with the, with the accepted article, and we publish the author response as a means to unearth the discussions that are going on in peer review before that article was published. And they can be really informative as to how that science has evolved. Um, and we're also trying to help peer reviewers to name themselves. So about a third currently do. We encourage them to do it. It's not mandated. There are reasons why people might not want to do it. But we do believe that greater transparency in peer review will help to drive up the quality of the review going on um, and trust in the system. Uh, within the journal, we try to uh, innovate in the types of articles that people can use to, to, to shift behaviours. And so we've introduced this, this type of article called a research advance, which basically makes it very clear that you can build on past work and we can link that work to, um, so you can add maybe updated data, maybe some data's come out that's brand new for that year and it's not, it wouldn't traditionally be seen as a novel finding or something very brand new because it's not the first time you've trying to do that research, but actually it's really important that it's connected in and has just as much um, exposure as the original time. Like the first time, the example I'm thinking of, the first time that they made a map of the Zika virus in, um, across the world, actually that data got updated one or two years later. And it's really important that when you go and look at that Zika research, you go to the up-to-date data. So it's really important that that work doesn't get hidden in other journals because it's not original. So we've got this um, mechanism to allow people to uh, make more incremental advances of the work they do. Uh, which seems very simple, and obviously on the web you just link forward and link back between it, but it's not something that works so naturally amongst the normal journal uh, ecosystem at the moment. Uh, and we also, preprints are a new thing to biology. Uh, they may not be new in some of your background areas, um, but we're very much trying to encourage people to adopt preprints in biology. And so we have a direct transfer mechanism with one of the main servers. And there's other things we're trying to do to highlight when an article has been a preprint, to, so to showcase good behaviours, responsible behaviours, and also trying to um, help with projects uh, in the ecosystem that encourage people to really look at preprints and discuss them and make them part of the research workflow. Because all that does is it makes the research get out there earlier and it allows the whole community to provide feedback and hopefully to make it a much better product at the end before it becomes the final publication. Uh, and I think it's important to note that reproducibility in the life sciences, some of it is computational, and I'll talk a lot more about that. But uh, in reality, in the, on the bench, in the wet lab, uh, there's a lot of things that need to be shared by biologists to actually support reproducibility that isn't to do with code. So one thing we're doing is we've got a transparent reporting form that includes things like the sample size and replicates and the statistics about it, but also where the source data has come from. And we also collect other information about the uh, biological samples they've used and all the reagents they've had. And we try to collate that all into the article so the information is there uh, for people to see. OK, so that's about the journal. I'm very happy to answer any other questions about the journal, but I would like to move on to the innovation side of things uh, to focus a bit more on that. So the eLife Innovation Initiative um, is basically this, it's a fairly new initiative. We formalized it about, it's been going on for a few years, but it's become more formal with 
uh, the creation of my role. Um, and it's this effort to invest in open source technologies that help to improve how research is communicated or discovered um, and used, and also how it's evaluated, which is one of the toughest issues. Um, in general, what we're trying to do is to create ourselves uh, a whole open source platform of services and applications that really do research justice in the 21st century with the technologies that we have, and also to support people in the ecosystem to contribute to this whole suite of services so that we can uh, build it together. And it's important to us it's open source because it allows everyone to contribute and it allows it really allows those services to grow and breathe in a very healthy ecosystem. Um, uh, so we're quite, we're very much pro open source. Um, one of the first technologies that was developed uh, was called eLife Lens. It's an idea from a PhD student. Uh, very simple idea. Martin and I were talking about this earlier, actually. Uh, it's very frustrating when you're reading a research article and the figures are all over the place and you're having to reference back to a paragraph half a page up and all the time. Uh, and this is very simply, OK, well, let's use the, the article and we can put the text on one side and you can click on the figure and it'll show up on the right hand side and you can see the two side by side. It's a very, very simple idea, um, but it's very effective and this has been adopted by several journals um, and you can do it on our site. It's called Side by Side now, not eLife Lens. Um, so this is one of the very first things we did and we, uh, it's an example of how we really do listen to what people would like to do and uh, work to develop those technologies to solve frustrations. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but we are doing work basically to uh, change how publishing works in the back end and how that's presented through an online journal. So we've got our own modular infrastructure for publishing the research, so taking the research when it's in an XML state, so a machine readable state, pushing it out to our journal, pushing it out to third party services. We've developed that already. It's open source, it's modular, it's extensible, so you can take features that you want. And we're doing the hard work now of making it truly open source and actually used by other people. Um, and we've uh, this year partnered with Coco. Uh, who have also partnered with Hindawi to produce the open source technology to deal with the other side of publishing, which is getting the content in from the authors and going through peer review. Um, uh, and to do all this with very best software development practices, um, at the moment there's not a product that does that. Uh, and there is a step in the middle that's a difficult step, but we want <laughs> that's yet to be tackled. <laughs> uh, but that's how publishing works, and we're trying to make sure that we can bring best practices into the whole workflow. Um, if you are interested, it is all open source. It's not always very easy to navigate, but there is, I'm very happy to share these links, um, but there is an easy link to get to all of our products. And we're also very transparent about how you can start to use them. So we very recently published a blog, our head of technology published the breakdown of how it is that you could become a publisher using eLife Continuum, which is the, uh, the publishing platform, and how much that might cost you in different, uh, different scenarios, basically. We're very open to discussions about these things. Um, something that's going to come in very, very shortly is uh, that we're very keen that research doesn't, doesn't end at the publication and that it lives on. And one of the things, the ways that research can live on is that people can discuss it. Uh, and so we've worked with Hypothesis to develop an integration um, on our platform, but they're also using with other publishers, which basically allows you to have a, an inline or whole page discussion annotation on PDFs and on, on the web, on HTML. Um, and so you can start to actually uh, build on the literature, talk to each other. It's very, very open. We like Hypothesis because they use the W3C framework, uh, the standard annotation framework, um, and they're a whole open source venture as well. This is just an example of a preprint on Archive that people have started to discuss. Um, and it's happened on, uh, on Pub and Central as well, where authors actually get involved and start to add information, add updates, and it really does make research live on. Uh, so shortly, uh, we'll be able to see an eLife group, um, which means that by having an eLife channel through Hypothesis, we can moderate comments. We're, we very much want to make sure it stays scientific discussion. Um, but you're also free to use normal Hypothesis. It's a plugin. If you haven't ever used it, I really I recommend it personally. Uh, it's, a, it's an extension you can add to your web browser. Um, and it's a really good way to take notes on the web. Uh, so that's sort of things that we're doing uh, at eLife. We also support people around us. So I run eLife blog, uh, Labs, which is a blog site that talks about ideas and new projects, new tools coming out that are, are really trying to innovate in research communication. So uh, this, these blogs that you can see at the moment, that's us being transparent about how it might cost to use our open source technology. 
there's a discussion about the importance of knowing where data has come from and how if people are going to make metrics out of data, actually you need to know what those metrics, what that data means before you start evaluating a metric. Um, there's a launch of a, a pro uh, project by some uh, researchers to get people to discuss on preprints. And there's uh, a report of some work we did with Open Knowledge International about the quality of data shared through eLife. So there's a whole mixed bag on eLife Labs, but the point is we start to showcase ideas and tools and that technologists and researchers alike can both, can all see what's going on and hopefully contribute back to the discussion. And we can, uh, we can start to experiment with some of these ideas. They're not all gonna pan out, that's absolutely okay. Um, but the idea is that at least we stimulate, stimulate some thinking, some innovation. Uh, we've also sponsored some projects to uh, prototype uh, phase so that they can be released into the wild and allow researchers to use them and see what needs changing, see what works. Um, the first one we did was Science Fair. Uh, this was from a researcher in Cambridge who had basically made himself a desktop science library, so a bit like a reference manager, but he was using the XML, not PDFs, and uh, he's basically built this on a peer-to-peer sharing network uh, in such a way that the articles basically uh, automatically update so that you are collecting the most recent data, data from the data source, uh, which at the moment is eLife and PubMed Central. And it displays it in this side-by-side -side format, so no longer having to flick through PDFs in your reference library. Um, it's, it is still the first prototype, the first beta of this tool, and there's lots of features that Rick, the creator, wants to add. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to see how this grows. That came out earlier this year. Um, and it's, of course, open source so that you can check it out if you want. Uh, and a second one that came out a bit later this year was this uh, product called Refigure. Uh, again, it's a prototype's very early stage, but the initial idea came from the fact that you see figures across the literature and you know they might be doing something similar. They might be asking a similar question, for instance. And you want to see side by side these graphs. Often, if you're doing a literature review, you probably have them printed out yourself. You might have multiple windows open in a screen, but what if you could collect these images together and actually write a comment based on the fact that you've compared across some graphs and you can see they're going the same way, or actually they look really different, and why are they different? Um, so that's where the idea came from, and what they've actually produced is this Chrome extension that can, on supported sites, uh, when you click on the image, it draws in the legend information for you, draws in the citation, it does all the hard work, the legwork for you, so all you have to do is click on the image you want, go to your next page, click on the image, and then you start to build this collection. And we've seen it used to collect individual um, studies of individuals with the Zika virus, and if, when you put them all together, you start to see there's a pattern emerging when you start to collate case studies. Uh, that's just one example. And many use cases for how you could use Refigure, again, it's very early on. Um, and we're excited to see what might be happening. But it's, I like the idea that it's linked things across the web, because that's ultimately what the web's meant to be for. <laughs> um, OK, so on to reproducible research. I'm going to take a quick pause and ask if there's any questions so far. This has basically covered the journal and what we're doing with innovation. And I'm going to dig into some projects now. Is that OK? Am I speaking too fast? No? Good, thank you. OK, so encouraging reproducible research. Um, I bring this up because Kirsty is one of the ones that invited me here, and I know that Kirsty and Martin are doing a lot of work to talk about reproducible research at Turing, um, and we are embarking on projects ourselves to improve how research is shared. So, if you do all the hard work yourself before publication to make it all reproducible, at the moment the journals are probably letting you down, uh, and you can't do much with the really rich information that you've ga gathered. And we want to change that. Uh, I am actually going to skip through this. Oh, there are, it's good to say that there are some real, really good reasons to focus on this in the life sciences. Um, there was an open science prize last year, which was uh, about using open data for some, for research that could, um, basically translating open data into, into genuine use cases uh, for life sciences. And the, the team that won it had basically made this mapping tool to see how the Zika virus had evolved. And they did it for Zika, they did it for Ebola. Um, they used real life open data data sets. They credited the data uh, producers when they did this. Uh, and it's a real win for showing how, um, when you do share data in the life sciences, the tools that can be built on top of it and the actual, trans like the real world applicability of those tools is really quite big. Um, and there's also another reason, which is that <laughs> obviously things go wrong in research. Um, and it's quite well known that biologists use Excel a lot. Um, but Excel doesn't do well 
with gene names, for instance. And there's been a well-known, well-publicized study about this. Uh, and recently, a tool's been made to actually start to automatically scan Excel sheets when they've got hum human genome codes in them uh, to see if there's been any, er any errors in those Excel sheets, because it can genuinely change the results of your study. Um, uh, and also, when data isn't shared, there's not much you can do about it when you realize there's been a problem. So there was also uh, a bug found in some fMRI analysis software, but because none of the data had ever been shared historically, there's no way to know whether those findings are supported or not, uh, or if that bug really did affect anything or not. Um, it's supposed that it, it probably did, but we have no way of knowing. Um, and people, researchers generally agree there's a reproducibility crisis, um, and we need to do more to help people to share everything they've done. So in the life sciences, uh, people are generally broadly aware that they need to be sharing their data. I'm just focusing on data because it's what the surveys give us. Um, and half of them say they make their data available somehow. And that might be emailing, like someone's asked them by email, they just share it by email. But at least it's making their data available. Uh, and only a quarter actually make the full data set available. Um, and not all of that is necessarily open access. So there, there's, we've got quite a long way to go with improving data sharing, but also sharing, the data's just the first step for life sciences. There's also the code and there's everything else going on around the research. Um, and there are ways that the ecosystem's trying to deal with this. Uh, so for instance, a lot of highly, rep highly reputable journals, including ourselves, <coughs> act as a stick and we mandate that data is shared where, when, where it's appropriate. Um, and we make data sets citable in our publications uh, they've got their own DOI. So we're doing lots of things through the journal to try to encourage people to share the data. And there are specific journals being set up for sharing data. Um, uh, one of the problems we have, it's all, it's all very well as, as a starting point to encourage people to share, but we're not yet at a state where people understand how to share well. Uh, so I mentioned that we'd done some work recently with Open Knowledge International, and they looked through, they use good tables, one of their tools, uh, looked through our article data sets um, and found that most of the article data sets had some, some, some error in them that basically made the data set invalid by their tool. But their tool is assessing things like blank rows, blank columns, missing values, a lot of structural issues. And actually what this really pairs down to is the fact that a lot of biologists like to share um, data in a very easy to read form on an Excel spreadsheet as opposed to a programmatically readable form. Actually, in this example, these uh, researchers did share it in a nice way. And I then, by process of, just to illustrate the problem, a lot of data sets I was looking at actually look like this. So it's the same kind of data. That's how most people might be sharing it. But some, some researchers are, doing, are sharing it in the machine readable form. Um, so what can we do to bring all of this data much closer into the narrative? I strongly believe that in order to help people to share their work more, we need to make it obvious that there's a reason to do it and we need to make it beneficial and that uh, it's an enrichment to the research as opposed to just being a mandate that you've got to share your data and we, no one's going to use it. So um, we've really asked this question quite hard about what can we do to bring, bring all these qualities into the publication uh, a lot more. Uh, we know that we're not the only ones to have asked this question. There are lots of other platforms that are experimenting with adding in more interactive data tools and uh, including IPython notebooks. Um, Mm, skip over this. It's just a basic point that biologists use Excel. Um, there's also uh, people do use R Markdown to make their work already. One of our reproducibility projects, we were the publishing partner for the Cancer Biology Reproducibility Project, and Tim Arrington at the Center for Open Science for all of those projects has translated the work the researchers did into R Markdown files. So they are all available, uh, but they aren't like that's in a separate place to where the articles were actually published on eLife. Um, because at the moment there's no way to serve the fact that Tim's put a lot of effort into making these dynamic documents that contain the data and the code um, because the way that we accept articles as a journal, as, as many journals, is as Word or PDF. Um, we do know already that people are making Jupyter notebooks uh, about their research and people tend to link them in their figure legend but there's no standard way to actually find all, these, all the work that people are doing and it's not obvious to us Who's, who's doing their work in Jupyter Notebooks, who's doing their work in R Markdown at this stage. Um, we know it's hugely beneficial when people do do this, uh, that these resources are shared with peer reviewers, and that kind of goes on behind the scenes. So 
Uh, in this example, Stephen Eglin, who's a researcher in Cambridge, had shared his R Mark Dime file with the reviewers when he went through GigaScience. And one of the reviewers actually went and ran it, didn't like the way that one of his figures was done, changed it, sent it back to him with the update. He didn't have to do the work, the reviewer had done it for him. Um, and they also checked that actually they agreed with what he found from his results. Um, <coughs> and there are other, there are other uh, innovations in the ecosystem that are really starting to make this much easier for researchers to produce interactive and reproducible uh, computational research. For instance, Binder is a tool that turns a GitHub repo it, do it basically dockerizes a GitHub repo, so you can just share the binder link, and anyone anywhere can click on that, and it opens up in a container through the browser. Um, you can run the Jupyter Notebook yourself. So there are there's lots of ways that researchers are trying to deal with this frustration, and as a publisher, we're trying to do uh, we're trying to deal with it from our end. So, as a publisher, we have some constraints, and that is that we do always need to be able to deliver the peer-reviewed final article in a static version. Uh, not everyone has access to the right kind of bandwidth or uh, a good enough internet access to uh, do really fancy things. So we will always deliver a static article and that's, that absolutely has to be preserved. That's one of the jobs as a publisher. Um, it has to, yeah, the work that we, we share has to be persistent. We have to make sure that it's accurate. Um, and there are all these questions of if we start to have interactive or dynamic articles, who's gonna, who's gonna pay to host all the assets that go with these, and who's going to pay for the compute if people are going to start to rerun figures? Um, so these are all open-ended questions. And we have to deal with researcher practices as well. Uh, and so that's shifting behaviors. But we did ask our eLife audience. Um, and uh, of those who already use our Markdown and Jupyter Notebooks, they're all very, very keen to be able to submit and present their work in that kind of form. Um, they're obviously putting a lot of work into it. And it's a shame to have to export it as a Word or a PDF and then send it to a journal. Um, uh, and it doesn't, it's not just the people who already use these technologies, but um, looking at a, a, a wider demographic, uh, there is interest in, we asked them basically what they'd want to do, and people want to be able to take away the data and code from an article. They want to be able to interact online, um, and then probably do deeper work in their own environments once they've taken away the data and the code, and they definitely want to be able to submit their research man manuscript in a, in a better way. And that interest is coming from neuroscience, biochemistry, computational biology, um, genomics, fields that already use quite, potentially quite data intensive uh, work. So in collaboration with a development agency called Substance, who developed Lens, the side-by-side -side view, and Stencilla, which is um, actually a one-man band, um, making a new, a new method of uh, authoring reproducible research. We are uh, collaborating with them to support a project to create the stack of tools needed for people to author, compile, and publish computationally reproducible manuscripts online. Um, that's a short link that will take you through to a blog post that describes the project, but it is very much at the start. We started in September. Uh, our goal is within a year to have developed and published one working prototype of a reproducible document on the journal uh, so that we can demonstrate that it is possible to do it from end to end. Um, the vision is, because it's really important for us to produce a static uh, manuscript, a simple static manuscript, that won't change. The vision is that as people read that manuscript, you might go from the static version on point one to something that's slightly interactive, and maybe then digging into the code and then taking that code away with you. So there's a, a very much an enhancement uh, as people are interested. So not everyone will use it, and we just serve the people who, need to, who are able to and are interested to use it. Um, it needs to be platform, tool, and language agnostic. We're never going to dictate what academics can do. It's really exciting to see how many tools are coming out in this system, and we don't want to inform people's choices. And it's really important to me and to others that it's made easy for everyone. And here I'm going to return to talk a little bit about Stencilla, um, which is this tool that's trying to make the Jupyter Notebook concept much more accessible to non-coders. Uh, not everyone codes in Python or in R. Um, and actually, people are very familiar with Excel. And so what uh, Nakome Bentley, who's behind Stencilla, is doing is he's creating what he likes to call the, the office suite for reproducible research. He's got a spreadsheet, and he's got a document editor. And it's uh, about making it very simple and easy to be doing your data analysis and porting that into a document using simple functions. Uh, you can do R, you can do Python, you can do other languages in it. Uh, but he also has the much more simple uh, uh, functions that biologists are much more um, 
much more recognisable, much more familiar with. Um, and we hope that that will help people to, a lot more people to engage with this kind of way of documenting their research. Because even if you're doing wet lab work, work everyone has to analyse data at some point, And that is a point where we can be capturing this kind of work in a much better way. Um, for us, we think that making this work through the journal means that we can help this kind of reproducible research persist in the system because that's one of our roles as a journal. Uh, we can also leverage the incentive system that already exists, which is publications. Um, and it would be great if, these, if we weren't frustrating researchers by saying, well, it's great you've done all this up to this point, but sorry, we can't support that as the journal. So flatten it down, send us something more simple. Uh, and also we have a community. Every journal has a community around it and we can share best practices because people will be reading the journal, seeing what others are doing, and hopefully it'll help these practices to spread. It's really important that we do this open source for us because it means that anything that we do, if it works, it can be shared across journals. We're not the first ones to have experimented with this, but it may be that the time is a lot better now um, and people are much more comfortable with this and the technology is really developing. Uh, we also think that it will help people to do build on what we've done to stimulate further innovation people may take in different directions. Um, and because it's open source, we'll be engaging with a whole community of uh, technologists and researchers who are able to put in feature requests and it really helps the system to grow healthily. Uh, but there are big problems that we still need to address as a whole ecosystem, and that is just to help people to be sharing much better quality resources, uh, which takes time. Um, and ultimately, at the moment, a lot of people don't see a benefit or don't see that they have the capacity to be doing this. So we are very much aware of these issues and very open to ideas for things we can do to make it easier. OK, I'm going to move on to data science at Eli. We're at 22. Um, I can go through, through this in about 10 minutes. Uh, has anyone got any questions so far? Any questions about the reproducible documents? Anything they'd like to share? Any comments at this point? While I take a sip of Ribena. <laughs> Does it surprise any of you that people are working on this? Is it good to see? Oh, definitely. Yeah. OK, good. Are there any issues that come to mind that you're like, well, that's not going to be possible because of x, y, and z? Please do knock us down. <laughs> no? I don't have an answer, and we're one of those journals as well where the editors very much want to see groundbreaking work. So even though we've got this advanced template, um, and that definitely does mean that work is built on it, they still want to see a sufficient enough advance because we're trying to operate in this top tier journal space. Um, and there is a value for filtering work, so people who only want to see big advances in fields that are kind of outside of their expertise. There is a role for journals to filter. Uh, or for some way, some way for the community to filter what is a big advance and what's less of an advance. But how do we know what's less of an advance at this stage in this moment? And it is definitely a discussion the community always has as to, you know, should we be ha having that, that kind of um, uh, barrier or filter? I don't have an answer, I'm sorry. We all have a way we'd like the world to work. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments? Yeah. But would um, all the other big publishers using eLife's open source <laughs> tools be considered a success at eLife? Personally, yes. Yeah. We've been set up, we've been given money by research funders to change the system. If the system changes, that's a success. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be much harder to move researchers off brand names than it is to push improvements into other, other spaces. So actually getting the brand name to change what they do rather than like bring down. That's my personal opinion. I, I think it's shared. Yeah. I can't speak for the whole company, um, but I'm pretty sure that's shared. And personally, I've asked this question of other people before, and definitely it's not about eLife taking over. Um, we're here to do a job, and we're here to fulfill our mission, uh, and we're doing open source for a reason. Um, yeah, I'd see that as a success. Um, Okay, data science stuff at eLife. So it's really cool to work in a 
we're kind of a young, like a startup. It's very open, open plan, like this Turing is. Um, and our new head of technology had the vision to see that it'd be really useful to start to do some data science projects. But there's a lot of data that exists about science and about publishing, um, and trying to dig into that and see what we can do to really help publications live on, help to unearth what it is that researchers are doing, and really bring, like, fill in some of the gaps that at the moment. Uh, we're still operating in an old system, and we're not really taking advantage of all the information that is out there. Or some companies are, but they're doing it in a very closed, uh, for-profit way that, or proprietary way that means it's very hard for other people to get involved and to use their work. Um, so there's three things to talk about. One is a project called Science Beam. So Daniel, Issa, um, what we've actually done is we've gone through the ASI. Do you know the ASI? They do some internships. So we've done three internships with them now. Daniel was our first intern, and we now actually employ him as the full-time data scientist, and he started this project called Science Beam, which is the idea of trying to extract PDF research, data from the PDF research, and put that into XML, very structured XML. That's the machine-readable format that publishers use. Um, and it, if it's in that format, it unlocks a whole load of uses, much easier to text mine, data mine. Um, and there's a lot of literature that is still PDF. So a lot of historic literature has been PDF, um, and a lot of preprints are out as PDFs, not as machine-readable format. So it's, it'd be really, this is a really hard problem to tackle. We're not the only ones to be tackling it. And there's different approaches that people have taken. But what Daniel's tried to do is uh, to see, oh, that's really poor quality, sorry, is whether we can use computer vision, whether he can use computer vision to understand the structure of what the PDF is to pick out then that, oh, well, this looks like it's the title. Uh, and that might be a journal name up there. And this looks like it's an abstract because it's a first paragraph block. And that kind of um, inference. And so he's been modeling. Uh, he's used a, a set of PDFs we've got from PubMed Central. Um, and he's been modeling a, um, an algorithm based on it and seeing whether, whether it works. Uh, this is also, at the moment, using very structured PDFs. These are ones that are historical literature that have been, through, been typeset by publishers. So they're much more structured. I, I see a massive value in being able to do this with preprints, but that's much harder because that's the authors dictated how, what's happened in that. Um, and it's, not, it's much less structured. Um, that's quite exciting. Uh, another project, our third intern, uh, David, uh, oh no, sorry, this is still da Daniel's work. Um, and these slides I'm about to show were made by Mark Patterson and Dario Taraborelli for a recent Crossref me meeting. Uh, but Daniel has been working on um, citation data. So the initiative for open citations basically is this push for citation data um, in Crossref, so Crossref amalgamate all the citation data from across publishers, but it, by default it's closed. Never, well, no one's thought before this year to be like, well, why is it closed? Because actually if we knew all the citation data, we can start to understand what's the knowledge graph of science, what's happening, what's, what's this publication, how has it been cited? Has it been cited a lot initially and then it's dropped or has that been built over time? There's so many questions you can ask and there's a lot of proprietary infrastructure to do this, Web of Science and Scopus, and, but it's not open. Um, so it's this idea that actually if all this citation data was open, a lot more things could start to be created based on it. And just to clarify, a citation is just a link between one paper and another paper. So there's a link in the literature between these two, two papers. Um, so that's what the initiative has done. And through that push to make citation data open, about half of it, half of the citation data in Crossref is now open. Um, there were some big publisher groups that signed up. And so although we've not got it all yet, we can start to play around with the data. And that's what Daniel has been doing. Uh, let's skip through this bit. So what Daniel did was that he extracted the data via the Crossref API. That was actually quite problematic. This is what happens when you experiment with things. And there's not yet in place the, it's not easy for the first people. And I'm sure as data scientists, you might know that. Um, but it took him a long time to extract the first data dump from the Crossref API. Um, and he found that actually not all Crossref records, so that's the, this is a publication and this is the metadata of the publication. Uh, not all records have citation data, so not all of them come, not all of the papers come with their reference set, basically. Um, and of the 40% that do, only half of them have that as public data. Um, and so there are, in Crossref's massive data dump, there are a billion connections, there are a billion citations over a billion citations, and half of those links are open. Uh, half of those uh, have DOIs, so half of them basically have a unique identifier that you can map on to each other. So they have a common connecting factor. Otherwise, you've got to work out what those DOIs is, so that when you say, 
oh, I'm citing, um, I'm citing Penfold et al. 2017, uh, and then someone else says I'm citing DOI, blah, 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 that they're, they're both citing my paper, but one of them hasn't written the DOI in it, so it's really hard to map that onto my paper. Um, so basically, not all of it has the information it needs to be able to become a map, and it required quite a lot of cleanup. So we're working with a reduced data set, but still from that, there's a lot of records to play with. And what Daniel did was that he, uh, and the second intern, Lisa, also did this, that they used the page rank al algorithm uh, and compared it to uh, citation number, citation count. So um, if a paper was being published like a thousand times, uh, in general, it had a higher page rank. There's a general trend upwards, had a higher page rank. So you'd think it's more influential as well. I don't know enough about page rank algorithm, but I'm sure some of you probably know a lot more than me. Um, but it's, the, it's to do with what cited it. So if you're cited by a highly influential paper, then that's, that's a lot more influential than being cited by a paper that's never been cited itself, uh, if I understand that correctly. Thank you, Martin. So in general, there is a trend upwards. So high cited papers have high page rank, but you can see there are anomalies as well. And maybe some papers aren't, don't have a high citation count, but they have been pretty influential because they've been cited by some pretty influential papers. And so we can start to dig in to see whether citation counts are, are they a useful metric. And it's just an open question. And there's a lot more we can start to do as the data gets better and we get access to more of the data. Oh, and I like that Mark's included this. This is his Jupyter notebook. This is Daniel's Jupyter notebook. Um, that's, that's a zoom in. His Jupyter notebook is ridiculously long, and I've got links. Oh, yeah, there's a link to it there um, if you were, wanted to play around with what he's done. Um, let's get through this. Uh, um, and then our third intern, David, uh, also then wanted to extend that question of looking at citation data to adding context. So where has a paper been cited? Uh, by that, we don't mean which journal or, like, who cited it, but in a paper, is it cited in the introduction? So is it, like... Uh, information that's the background to a project. Uh, is it cited in the method? So maybe this is a particular method that's always used. There's some papers that are really highly cited because they're how do you sequence DNA? And it's always cited in the methods. Um, has it been cited in the results? So maybe you're building on directly on someone's previous work. Has it been cited in the discussion? Um, so maybe it's like bringing in an external, external point. Um, why has it been cited and how has it been cited? He's also tried to dig into what's the language used when it's been cited. Are you, is this supporting information? Is it positive or is it not? These projects, by the way, are only six weeks long. So what David managed to do in the time was really impressive, and it's, but it's very much the starting point. He took some very well highly cited papers uh, and looked at where they were being cited uh, in other papers. And so, for instance, you've got one paper that's been cited over a thousand times that has got quite a spread of uh, how it's being cited. So it's pretty equal. The main text includes the methods and results. So it's pretty equal between the introduction and the main text. Uh, so maybe this is work that's being built on or discussed a lot in terms of well, how the science is being built on it. And there's one that's very much highly in the main text, in the methods and the results. And maybe that's actually, that's probably a method itself and it's being used a lot there. Um, and then if you actually look at what these papers are, if you look at this paper A, uh, this first one, uh, you can see how it's actually starting to be cited. And actually, if you start to read these, there was no linkage here. Our results contrast with, um, there's actually start to, you start to pull out as a human reading these words that actually maybe this paper's being cited a lot at the moment because it's quite controversial. Other people aren't replicating what it found. It's quite a, a matter of discussion in the community. Um, and that's, that's quite interesting to, to start to see that pattern with where it's being cited in these papers as well. Um, so David was really interested to try and dig into that kind of language. Uh, and he tried to apply some natural language processing to the uh, sentiment of the, of the citation. There are several problems, which is that you actually might cite a paper quite early on and then later on just call the authors. So you don't cite the paper again. So the sentence where you actually say something is way further down in the paper than where you've actually cited it. So you've got to find, you've got to find within the paper the actual true story of that citation. And when you do do that, uh, the current algorithms are designed for very expressive uh, language. So Twitter's very emotive. You have extremes, extreme positive, extreme negative. That does not work for science because we're too polite and too neutral in science. So we criticize and we support, but we do it in very neutral language. So you can't apply the current algorithms. Um, so that was David's work. Um, and we'd love to be able to take this forward uh, and to start to understand what a citation means. Um, it would be great to know if something's positive or negative. It would be great to know why something's highly cited so people can start to have a much more intelligent view of this 
this measure, which underpins a lot of metrics and evaluation. Um, and finally, the third thing I'd like to talk about is something very, very new. We haven't started this at all yet. Uh, it may never happen, but I'd love to see if you're able to support it or if you're interested in this. Um, one of the key blockers to trying to bring about more open practices uh, or more responsible behaviours in science is that researchers, even if they're on board with that, uh, feel unable sometimes to do that because they're being evaluated based on very restrictive criteria when they go for jobs or for funding. And I'm sure that's not an unknown story for people in the room as well. Um, but there has been work to try to flesh out what it is that research is doing. So in the life sciences, and I know this differs field from field, but in the life sciences we have the authors all listed at the top. Uh, it's probably normal to have about six to eight authors at the moment. Some have thousands where you have big projects. Some might be still single or just two authors. Um, but in general, you have this kind of number of authors. And actually, the, all that we really recognize is that Susanna probably led this project as the PhD student, and Ole Paulson was probably the PI. And that's what we know as the code, where we have this author order, and that's, just, that's all we take through it. But who knows? I know Wolfram Schultz is a big gun in the field and probably did some conceptual stuff, but only because I know his name. But otherwise, he sat right in the middle. Who knows what he did? And we have data scientists and RSEs in the, in the room, and probably a lot of the work that you're on papers, you may well be in the middle, and no one can appreciate the work that you've done. So we have no idea what these people really have done except that we do use the credit terminology. So credit is a way of assigning actual contribution roles to the authors. And at the moment on eLife, you can hover over Susanna and it will say that she did a, did a lot of the data collection, she did the writing and whatever. Um, so this is the credit terminology. It's very standardized terminology. It's in use by a few publishers, but not many. And it's an effort to try to start to formalize. It's, it doesn't capture everything. And there is still free text that needs to be added so that people can really say what they did on a paper. But at least it's goes some way to coding what it is that someone's contributed to a project. Uh, and one of our, my colleagues has very much taken this to heart because he's been dealing with a paper he's been trying to publish where they've been arg arguing over the author order. And he was like, surely there's a better way to do this. And so he's been asking around and experimenting. And he came up with, this is just a mock-up. This is not what we do at eLife. But what if you could present authors like in a film style credit and actually, you could then see that Susanna's done a load of this. She's in a lot of these things. She's really very much involved. Um, uh, whereas you can, you can see that Ole is the PI because he's conceptualized, done some methodology, got the funding, added resources, done some admin and supervision. But um, he's, yeah, he's less on the actual analysis and data side. Um, so you can really start to draw out what it is that people have done. And you can start to see people as actually what they're contributing to the work you'd hope. Um, but this is really early stage, and we've just put out a labs post about it. But our idea is if we can collect this kind of credit information from the publishers that do currently have it, not everyone does, but if we can collate that data, that's a pretty interesting data set to start to dig in. Are there people who've published across these publishers that have this? And we can, can we start to build their profile? Can we start to see what it is they've done. Is there a typical type where you early career doing a lot of the data collecting and then you move into the supervising? Can we see that? Can we see where some people are clearly analysts? And can we really make them shine as analysts? Um, so I'm really interested to start to dig into this. We haven't even created, collected the data together yet. Um, but if we do, we would very much be interested in anyone who might be wanting to work on that data. Um, it may be messy. <laughs> it may need a lot of wrangling. Who knows? Um, uh, but this is a first step for us to really dive into whether we can make it much more obvious that the work that the individual researcher is doing from the publication data that we have where they're all grouped together and quite, you know, they're not, they're not credited well. Um, so in summary, we're doing and looking at a lot of things. Um, we very much want help to help researchers share their work faster. That's the main part of our mission, accelerate discovery, and more incrementally. We, uh, with the stuff that we've done to make, to redevelop the online journal, uh, we very much care about things being accessible across mobile devices and with poor internet bandwidth. I didn't talk about that, but I can. Um, we're interested in how people interact with papers once they're out there. We don't think they should die on publication. Um, we very much want to support people who are baking in data and code and making their work much richer. Um, and we want to help people to recognize the work that researchers are doing and the best practices they're putting in so that that can be seen as a positive step forward and something for people to aspire to and to take on and adopt. 
so in essence, uh, this, this, these slides come from our executive director, Mark Paston. But he, the way he puts it, he wants us to go from publish or perish, which is the, what we say in biology and perhaps elsewhere, uh, to share and shine, um, <laughs> which I think is a nice sentiment to end on. Um, and my main question, although we've not got much time left, um, I'm hanging around, by the way. I've got another half an hour before I need to meet someone. Um, but it's how can we help you? Because the work that you do, everyone is analysing data, and it doesn't matter what kind of data you're analysing. There may be steps in the process that aren't working for you, and I'd really love to know about that so we can try to see if there's a way that we can resolve that. And there's probably frustrations that are shared in the life sciences too. Um, and also, how can you help us? Because there's a lot of work that you do to tackle some really big issues. I um, was having discussions this morning about uh, how do you access data um, when it can't be open? And how do you make sure that people can still use data even though uh, you know, just going full out and saying open everything is too far, it's too extreme, and actually we need to be much more sensible and sensitive to the fact that there is data that can't be shared, but we still want it to be used by others. We still want people to be able to work on it and for research to build around all of that content. It's rich and it's valuable. Um, so I'd love to hear projects that you're doing on uh, and whether you are interested in any of our data science um, or if you want to stop us because you know other things going on. Uh, for instance, we know that IBM are working on some of the stuff that we're doing as well, and we definitely want to collaborate with people. We're very open to collaboration. So I'm going to shut up uh, and ask you for your thoughts. And thank you for your attention as well.